without uh, Security in Context project, their sincere interest uh, in this anthology and uh, their logistical support, we were not we would not be able to prepare this event today. For those who are uh, watching us now or will watch us in the coming days, uh, please follow us, uh, follow us on Twitter at Security in Context and Facebook, or subscribe to our YouTube channel and to our mailing list through our website. All, uh, all these various links will be shared in the chat box and on Facebook. My name is Matteo Capasso. I am a Marie Curie Global Fellow between uh, Venice University in Italy and Columbia, New York, where I am working on a project dealing with the impact of uh, US-led imperialism in Libya. I am a core member of the War Economist Research Track of the Security in Context Project. And I can also say that I had the honor to participate to this uh, fantastic anthology that we'll be discussing today. The newly released book by Coma Press, an independent publisher in Manchester, UK, titled The American Way, Stories of Invasion. Let me spend a few words on the anthology. This is a refreshing and timely work for several reasons. Uh, first, it is a unique anthology on the devastating consequences that the US imperialism and its wars have brought throughout the entire world, from Asia to Africa, including Europe itself. Second, its peculiarity lies uh, in the approach, which combines the fictional stories with the historical analysis. Each chapter focuses on a US-led historical interference, whether via bombs, coup d'etat, gunboat diplomacy or sanctions in a certain country of the world, most, mostly in the South. In doing so, it offers both a fictional story, and I put inverted commas, to allude to the book's purpose of troubling the clear distinctions between reality and fiction. This is why each story is followed by a shorter and incisive historical afterward. The book starts with the US-led coup d'etat in Iran in 1953, with what became, as my mentor Eric Hoagland, an expert on Iran, always told me, a template for many more US-led coups to come over the years. And it ends discussing the case of Pakistan, one of the many countries, together with Iraq, Yemen, Libya, Afghanistan, caught in a state of forever war after 9-11. Consequently, the book appeals to any reader who is eager to be confronted with the strength and beauty of these short stories. These stories are not easy to digest, I must say, because the reader is faced with a, somewhat the, the gravity of the devastation that the US has brought upon the world and the entire planet upon this, this state. Uh, actually, according to a report from the Coast of War Project, the death toll of the US post 9-11 wars alone stand at an estimated cost of 897,000 to 929,000. The same report does not, the research note, include the many indirect deaths the war on terror has caused by way of disease, displacement, the loss of access to food or clean drinking water. The power of these stories indeed lies in how they take us into the mundane details of life and death beyond the numbers listed by reports. In this very act of uh, confronting, and here I'm using some of the language that the co-editors have put in the introduction, confronting the tapestry of lies that infects those of us who benefit from empire, these stories force us to turn our ears solely to those on the wrong end of American imperialism, the colonized. Finally, as an academic, I can say that this book has a significant pedagogical value that must be retrieved and brought back to the space of the classroom and to students. Its weaving of stories from the subjective location of those who remain under the thumb of American imperialism brings to mind Feminist ep epistemological concern with uh, situated knowledge, thus undermining those dominant frameworks of uh, objectivity, unquote, that reproduce the imperialist order in its racial, patriarchal, and class nature. Also, this book has a crucial historical value for older, younger, and future generations because it provides an entry point, a small door into a history of complete devastation that many of us in the West are ignorant of or simply pretend never happened. And I must say that the pedagogic system contributes, unfortunately, to this ignorance. To start the discussion of this unique anthology, I will be joined today by what I personally consider, because I've, I have learned 
so much just by reading their stories and also from the books and the various uh, works that they have published and I want to read now by the stellar list of four speakers whom I am honored to engage with today. For those watching us today or in the coming days, we are going to structure our discussion in two parts. First, our, um, our four speakers, starting with uh, Ra and Ursula, then followed by Usain and Lina, will reflect for seven, ten minutes each on what brought them to, the, to put this book together, discussing how the book came to light or their unique stories, uh, guiding us through their emotions, values and reasons attached to them. We hope this will offer our viewers a way to understand how fiction and narrative can become a tool to counter narratives of misery and destruction forged by US imperialism over the years. In the second part of the talk, we will have a more interactive discussion with all of them, which will continue to engage with the themes of the book, but also stretch to some of those issues that have come up in the written contribution for the Security in Context website. In fact, Please continue to follow us uh, on our media channels because we are about to publish some interventions from our speakers today that will reflect and expand on the issues to be discussed. So I guess my part is done. Let me move to our first speaker, Ra Page, who is the founder and CEO of Coma Press, an independent publishing house that specializes in short fiction. He has previously worked as a cultural journalist, sub-editor, festival coordinator, and short filmmaker. Ra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matteo. Um, I thought I'd just uh, start by introducing uh, what, what Comma does, and, and just to carry on with what uh, Matteo was saying, we, we specialise in the short story as a publishing house, which is quite unusual for any publishing house because it's, uh, it's not very uh, commercially profitable. Uh, but we're also very sort of dedicated to what the short story does, particularly uh, and specifically. And one of the things that is unique about the short story is it kind of aligns itself structurally uh, to uh, the voice and the perspective of underdogs. So uh, Frank O'Connor has his famous quote uh, saying that the short story doesn't have a hero in the traditional sense, the short story, what it has instead is um, submerged population groups. By that he meant underdogs, people on the fringes of society, people that are disenfranchised by society, etc. Another way of putting it is simply the short story doesn't have the luxury of, of the backstory of privilege. It only has uh, space for the front story of always having to start from scratch. So characters who don't live on their backstories or their ancestry or their privilege or whatever they've inherited, there's characters who are constantly sort of starting from scratch. So the short story lends itself to a certain type of character, not exclusively, but it does have this sort of leaning. Um, so being champions of the short story, we're, we're also interested in um, what, the, what the form can do with regard to history and the teaching and the telling or retelling and uh, exploration of history through fiction. If I kind of step away from common, think a little bit about uh, where this project came from, um, a lot of it um, comes from a, a kind of a, a, a dissatisfaction and a huge uh, kind of um, just um, kind of complete um, despair really at the lack of a, a British film industry. Um, I, I came to narrative through film and a love of film um, and the British film industry essentially doesn't produce anything that hasn't in some way got something to do with the monarchy. If you look at the list of top 10 films from Britain in the last 10 years, they're, they're all, they have the king or the queen or some, some reference to the monarchy in it. I mean, in TV and we're, we're now kind of obsessed with the crown, it goes on and on. Um, and um, it's also obsessed with biopics uh, about uh, supposedly famous or supposedly important uh, central critical figures. Um, in other words, British film subscribes to what uh, the Scottish historian uh, Thomas Carlyle called the great man theory of history. The great man theory of history essentially says that um, there's a line that Carlyle wrote, which was uh, the history of the world is but the biography of great men. Everybody else's story uh, is just kind of background kind of extras and background um, kind of um, just furniture, really. Um, the history of the world, according to this theory of history, can be boiled down to the biography of great men. There's something predestined about these great men, and we just need to learn about their lives, um, and, and, and then we, we know history. Obviously, this is, this is ridiculous, and it's debunked immediately by uh, 
um, serious historians, um, but it seems to pervade and seems to still apply to the way in which we understand history through culture. So, um, you know, you can get you can get lots of uh, films, big big budget films made about Churchill or about you know great admirals or great in quote scientists and uh, people who kind of uh, who who are presented as having uh, achieved their achievements almost in isolation. Um, but but you can't get anything more complex than that. Uh, our understanding of history as a country is, is warped by this continually uh, to the point where uh, a couple of years ago there was an argument on breakfast TV. Um, a, a TV presenter called Piers Morgan was having an argument with a young historian about Churchill's reputation. And uh, Piers Morgan was effectively saying, or was effectively saying that um, the Second World War was, was won single handedly by Churchill. Uh, which is beyond preposterous. Um, he, was, he was kind of describing the, the Second World War as like an arm wrestle between Hitler and Hitler and, and um, the other major players, Stalin and Churchill and Roosevelt, etc. It's, it's and Truman. It's just it's complete complete nonsense. Um, but it it does affect the way in which we think about history through culture. Um, I'm also really interested in the relationship between fiction and, and the media, fiction and news and nonfiction. Obviously, nonfiction has be, uh, become a, a space which attracts lies. It's a corrupted and, and corrupting space. Um, people, uh, voices rush to the nonfictional space with their lies, which they claim are true. Um, if you start with fiction, you essentially say, this is fiction. You own you own the fiction. You own the, the fact that it's a lie, which ties into some of the themes that Hussein was, was is talking about in his uh, his written piece. So it's so it's, for me, it's if if uh, news and nonfiction has been so infiltrated by fiction, then let's take fiction and let's have it infiltrated by by news and and real stories uh, and stories from a different perspective. I do uh, subscribe to. Uh, the, the Chomsky notion, you know, from manufacturing consent that news coverage and, and news media and journalism uh, effectively uh, is, is but a distraction. It's, it tells us that we're informed. It reassures us that we're informed about the important stuff, but it actually doesn't cover any of the important stuff. Um, so, for instance, at the moment, we're all talking about, uh, everybody's talking about, you know, the, the build up, the escalation of troops. Uh, uh, Russian troops on the border with Ukraine, but we're not told that Ukraine is is full of uh, American and British soldiers stationed there that have been put there through Obama overturning a democratically elected government a few years ago. So every story is filtered through through um, you know an imperialist prism, and it's filtered through an othering prism, and it's and it's filtered through a kind of top down prism. So. Um, with with uh, Como and our history into fiction series, we've we've commissioned a number of different books where we've placed writers with historians to talk about um, kind of grassroots experiences. We had two anthologies called Protest and Resist, uh, very simply named, uh, which were looking at the history of British protests and presented reimaginings of those protests, many of which are forgotten about and not talked about anymore, uh, from a from a, um, a grassroots point of view, and. Um, I didn't. I didn't imagine that I could. Uh, I could kind of be involved in a project as ambitious as this one um, until I met Ursula, who uh, I'll now hand over to. they will talk next. Um, Ursula is incredibly well connected with uh, huge swathes of uh, the kind of global literary community that I wasn't uh, connected to. I have. I have a lot of contacts with. Uh, the Arab world and certain parts of, of the world or the writing communities around the world but Ursula made this book uh, possible through her incredibly extensive kind of network of, of links um, and also her, her perspective. Um, she talked to me, we, we met a few years ago after I was involved in the Gaza project and, and Ursula talked to me a little bit about, uh, I think we talked about Gladio um, and Italian based um, stay behind networks and I had heard about uh, Gladio through a writer called Steve Chambers who has a, a novel called Gladio and it explores the possibility that there might have been a, been a, a, a British wing to uh, this network or British branch of this network uh, which has never been proven or disproven uh, but I had a very very loose a very faint understanding of 
of of that. So uh, so Ursula yeah, made so much of this possible. So thank you, Ursula. But I'll stop there. Thanks, Ra. Thanks so much. Uh, um, Ursula Casagrande is our next speaker. Uh, is a journalist and filmmaker. As a journalist, uh, she worked for 25 years for the Italian daily newspaper Il Manifesto and is currently co-editor of the web magazine Global Rights. She has translated numerous books as well as written her own ones uh, titled Tauri Colliery and uh, Bex with Dan. Ursula, correct me if I'm wrong on the last one. She's the editor and co-translator of Coma Press, The Book of Havana and The Book of Venice and co-editor of Kurdistan Plus 100, which is forthcoming from Coma. Ursula. Hi, hello everyone, everybody, and thanks for the for the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor to be to be with you. And uh, just uh, to start from where uh, Ra left it, uh, I have to say that it's uh, it's mutual mutual because without uh, without Ryan, without Coma, this book uh, would not have been possible. And uh, thanks to my uh, to, to my son and his uh, love at that time, uh, like in 2014 for Hollywood Undead, we uh, I met Ra in Manchester, and I specifically wanted to meet Ra because uh, he had uh, just published um, a number of uh, pieces uh, about the Gaza um, siege in, back in 2014. And to me, it was just like, you know, having been working in journalism for so many years, um, and, been, and because I love literature uh, and cinema, what, I, what struck me was that they were like little pieces of, uh, like little text of diaries or little uh, short mini stories from Gaza during the siege. And it was just so, they told, they told just so much more than what we had been uh, reading or I, I had been reading in, in newspaper or watching in television that I just made the point that I wanted to meet Ra and know more about Coma and start, well, I propose him to translate this piece, uh, this pieces, this text uh, to begin with, because I thought uh, that uh, they needed to be spread and needed to be read uh, from a, by a wider, by a wider audience. And then uh, that how it, uh, you know, how our collaboration, our collaboration started. And of course, I mean, in, in these years, I just saw, uh, uh, how um, coma work um, progressed and and uh, there are so many common uh, points and interest we have uh, whether it's in fiction or cinema or the concern for the world we live in in a, in a world if I might say like this and uh, and these of course things brought uh, other things and um, when we were discussing about the possibility of uh, of this anthology and I thought that it was uh, again that it was so needed and and so interesting because uh, again you know, I've been working mostly in uh, war zone during my years at the manifesto and uh, beyond, and war zone and conflict uh, resolution zone. Uh, the latest being uh, in in Havana, where I covered the um, work with the uh, the Colombian peace process. And so every time, you know, you, you read a piece of journalism and, you know, you read the stories, but journalism is more concerned with facts, also, you know, rightly so, than, uh, and chronicle rather than the stories. And what I always felt, uh, or, although I tried in my journalism to, to tell the stories and to tell the stories of the people and the consequences of war on people, uh, it is always lacking. And so, the, the, again, the short stories like cinema, uh, and we have here Hussein, who made the brilliant film about uh, the consequences of the war in Iraq, the invasion of the Iraq by the US and the, and the UK, uh, especially, and then all the European which, uh, which followed. But the, the, the need to, to read stories and to know about the consequence, consequences of war, looking from the other, side in a way i think it's uh, uh, it's so important and this anthology somehow provided this space and this possibility to give writers uh, the voice and the way to express themselves in fiction so not being bound and linked by uh, to to facts and to the reality 
um, but you know, be more a bit freer to 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 tell to tell stories and to tell the stories uh, of the people from the other side. And uh, on the other hand, it was also the pos it gave also the possibility to tell about the American. Uh, presence in in places which not necessarily uh, are so well known as uh, as other like Iraq uh, or like uh, the American uh, Latin American uh, countries and uh, well from being from Italy uh, like Matteo uh, one of the less known perhaps is uh, is Italy where in fact uh, Gladio and the American plan was the plan was an incredible well structured and uh, and well um, and well prepared plan but very very little very little known the same applied to to turkey to to a different extent where uh, again gladio in turkey you know it's very little uh, spoken of and um, and so I thought that uh, of course I when when Ra proposed this I I just you know, was so enthusiastic, uh, enthusiastically following the, uh, through to this uh, to this idea because I thought uh, that yes, it would give a, a different perspective and it would and it would give the possibility and the chance to to writers to 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 tell uh, to tell different uh, stories. And I think all in all, the the, the result I think it's amazing. I mean, even uh, you know, I've been reading uh, the stories when they were uh, uh, coming through, but then I read it again and uh, and really and. Uh, so so good stories and uh, and of course the afterwards provided the background or the context uh, to the to the story and I think they are uh, make a good uh, a good pair um, somehow and uh, and I think it's a, it's a different way to to approach uh, to approach what uh, what what happened and what is continuing unfortunately to to happen and um, and so yes i mean this is uh, uh, how i come to uh, to to be part of this uh, of this book of this project and for now yes this i say thank you ursula thank you so much uh, um i would move on to our next speaker who's uh, hussein karabey is a kurdish turkish film director screenwriter and producer his uh, first feature film, uh, Gitmek, or hopefully I pronounced it right, My Marlon and Brando was selected for the 37th uh, Rotterdam International Film Festival and the New York Tribeca International Film, receiving the Best Director Award. His other works include the award-winning Come to My Voice, um, produced in 2014, and Insiders 2018. Hussein, all yours. Hi, um, thank you for being me here. Uh, uh, for the great organization, and thank you for uh, Orsola. How she, somehow she convinced me to write my first uh, fiction uh, stories. I mainly writing only my scripts, but uh, I see uh, this is also good because as a filmmaker, I can not shoot a movie uh, every year, so I I have to wait six years or five years. So during this uh, between. Uh, to me, I can write fiction stories too. Um, I want to uh, mention a, about a little bit my background, how I approach to truth or reality or why I try to express myself with movies. Uh, I'm coming from the worker class family. I'm a Kurdish origin, uh, so I'm minority. Uh, when I find out that I am minority in my own country, uh, so you 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 are trying to find your uh, role model uh, in the society uh, and you want to express yourself or when you see the media through the television or uh, movies you always look in your own re uh, reflection uh, but i find out that uh, i was living in in different uh, turkey or ca different country or maybe movies are talking about different turkey which I don't know. Uh, so when I find out this is a weird, you know, they are showing, uh, you know, TV series or fiction movies, always representing something else, even though they speak Turkish. Uh, so I decided to do, uh, tell my own stories. You know, first of all, I wanted to document uh, my stories. Yeah, I, I start my career uh, making documentaries because 
in 90s, uh, still uh, the state was uh, uh, ignoring or uh, uh, or hiding whatever they do. You know, you know, if they do violence or uh, massacre, they said, no, we didn't do it. You know, if you don't have any proof, uh, moving pictures or uh, photos or some uh, witnesses, they ignored or they they never accepted. So. I started to do human rights uh, movies in my own country. Uh, and then I find out this is very powerful uh, to have uh, uh, my own way of documenting. But um, after, after years when uh, we had chance to have uh, cameras all around us, and I found out that uh, the, the, the documentary is not enough to tell the uh, risk of others, you know, to, to talk about the reality, to talk about the problems. So I start to make uh, fictions, fiction movies, but I always combine with the documentary. What I'm trying to say is uh, narrative is most important things for the, I think, human beings from the beginning of Homo sapiens or whatever you call the beginning of our uh, civilization or what, uh, but I call I, I prefer to call when the human being find the fire and first they uh, fire some meat to di di digest easily. Afterwards, they had time and they start to talk about the, their daily stories, how they hunt uh, this you know huge animal, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. During I think the narrative is only way to convince someone. To change their mind, you know, not the reality, not the information. We have to give this information or the the new reality, or your approach with the narrative. Uh, if you look at the uh, you know history, the main narratives are the uh, religion books. You know, there are three now important religion books or four at uh, this uh, for popular now. Uh, but before then, there were lots of different kind of narrative to uh, to organize the people's life. But now uh, this narrative uh, changed to the uh, media and movies, you know. Uh, so I think every day we are under the thousand of different kind of narrative which are trying to show us what is truth or what is the real. In this case, uh, I decided to do my own, own stories, I, I call them my own lies, you know, because when you are minority and when you're opposition, uh, the others always call you, these are lies, they, this is not happening. So I, <laughs> before then, them, I, I just say, these are my lies, you know, you know, their lies, so, so at least you can have choice now, you can believe. But I believe information, uh, we have to uh, consider what we do with information, you know. Uh, sometimes to be right is not enough to convince the rest of the society, even your own friends, your own people. I mean, um, we have to find the way to convince them to uh, uh, start to action or start to reject whatever they give us. And in this case, I think uh, fiction stories or, or making movies uh, make, make sense for me. And, I, I'm lucky to also see how the narrative changed people's life through the, my movies or some other friends' movies. I've, I really witnessed, you know, at the beginning I was thinking theoretically, but I saw also practically it changed. Uh, maybe it is because of our uh, human uh, nature or uh, anatomy, you know, how we accept the reality through the uh, seeing the reality, not on the reading. Uh, or imagining uh, it. Um, yes, uh, in this case, I, I just wanted to focus a little bit uh, about conception of uh, truth or conception of lies, you know. Why, why we don't defend ourselves like this, let's say. I mean, everyone has to say their own lies. Example, I mean, we can represent the reality in different way like this or uh, uh, before the using these lies things, I was uh, mostly using uh, this concept. I was telling that everyone has to tell their own stories 
not uh, not 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 the others should tell their stories. You know, everyone has the right to tell their own stories. If we hear the stories from the first hand, because we on we don't only hear the information, we hear the emotions and we hear uh, the, uh, the 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 routine of the life and how they affect with the invention and whatever you call for the uh, that power uh, they change people's life. So, but only information and uh, numbers, uh, uh, even though you defense the, uh, you know, uh, uh, people, it, it doesn't really affect the rest of the world, you know, if they don't know the stories, who are they and what were they doing during that war or during that invasion, what was they dreaming about, what, what was that they are trying to approach. And I think these kind of informations change the people and have a chance to have some empathy. Uh, so I find out the making films or the narrative stories, novels, is a great power uh, more than information or news or documentary. Thank you so much, Osain. Thanks. Um, um, there is a lot to be talking about in this sense uh, when it comes to what you've just discussed. But uh, we move to the next one. <clears throat> Uh, speaker who is Lina Meruane, uh, award-winning Chilean writer and scholar as well. She has published two collections of short stories and five novels. Uh, two of those have been translated into English, uh, titled The Nervous System and Seeing Red, both published by Atlantic. She has written an important essay on the representation and impact of the AIDS epidemic in Latin American literature, titled Viral Voyages. She's currently teaching creative writing and global cultures at NYU. Lina. Hi, hello. Um, thank you, Matteo, for that uh, generous introduction. And uh, I'm also, I also want to say that I was uh, very uh, happy, thrilled uh, to be invited by Ra and Ursula uh, to join so many spectacular writers in this anthology on a theme that I'm personally motivated about, uh, US intervention and sort of new forms of colonialism um, in today's world. Um, but this is not only a contemporary issue, of course, for Latin America, the US intervention started with the Cold War, meaning right after the Second World War, and uh, had really devastating consequences for the continent. And I am somebody who uh, was born uh, in 1970, so the coup catched up with me when I was three. So I lived you know, my entire uh, childhood almost and um, adolescence and almost the beginning of my adulthood, adulthood uh, under dictatorship. So this is a very uh, important issue, historical and, and, and present issue uh, for me. I'm also from Palestinian origin uh, through my father. And uh, this also makes me sort of the daughter of uh, people in exile, uh, also due to imperial colonialism. So these themes really touch me uh, very close. But I think it's crucial to maybe understand how in the Cold War, the so-called third world, now we call it the global south, uh, were turned, in, uh, turned uh, by the United States into sites of what was called also anti-communist intervention. Uh, what the Red Scare meant for us after the Cuban revolution in the late 50s and, the, and still during the Vietnam War, which was uh, uh, of course all of this supported uh, and by and engaged by um, US's anti-democratic regimes. So what that meant was military coups and long uh, deadly dictatorships uh, for most Latin American countries throughout 20 years, which is not a small amount of time. Um, but in addition, I think, and this is important to say, just to, to introduce also a little bit my story, uh, in addition, the US intervened in the reshaping of our economies uh, in order to turn them into laboratories of neoliberal policies, which said in a different way, is sort of the implementation of savage capitalism in uh, Latin America. 
And these neoliberal policies substituted the principle of social solidarity for one of economic efficiency, that is, uh, for economic policies or, or what was called the economic adjustment, uh, an euphemistic term uh, that meant policies which would be performed to the exclusive benefit of the elite, of the Latin American elites. Now, these measures were easily imposed under violent rule and were expressions of economic violence, which is very, very important to remember. Um, they impoverished large segments of the population in Latin America. And I'd say in particular, uh, this was the case in Chile. Chile was one of the examples of the US labs for their neoliberal policies. Um, and I also wanted to say that these policies were so harsh uh, upon the people that at some point in Chile, uh, they were softened and slightly reversed because they were unbearable. Uh, they were really creating a catastrophe economically. I think that also interesting to say is that many of the policies of these policies, uh, such as the pension system, just to name one, were never implemented in the United States and have been contested for very long in Chile and elsewhere. And we are actually today in Chile living the effects of a popular uprising and a new president elected precisely against these harsh policies that lasted not only throughout dictatorship, which we could say ended in the 1990s, but were extended also by our uh, during the years of the transition to democracy, which is another 20 years. Um, so while this is known within our countries, and sometimes as Mateo was saying, uh, uh, sort of uh, conveniently forgotten, um, it is seldom accounted for outside of academia uh, and outside of left-wing political circles and much less in the United States itself. So I have found myself throughout the years teaching also Latin American cultures and finding that my students who are somehow and sometimes coming from uh, Latin American countries uh, actually realize the story of their own parents uh, displaced and dispossessed and coming into the United States precisely because of these policies. So I do agree with Mateo that this book uh, also has a very important, important pedagogical uh, interest. Um, and I would be very happy if I, can teach global uh, interventions, US interventions in the global world uh, to adapt this book to my own curricula. And this is why also I think it's important for the general public to read these stories because they really tell us sort of the other side, the, the, as was said before, uh, the side that has never been heard, the emotional impact, the, re the how this actually turns out to be in the real, uh, context, in the local context, in the family, uh, in, in society. Um, I also wanted to say that I'm interested in sort of telling stories about smaller characters, the ones that remain unheard. And in my story, I uh, sort of made a point to have as protagonists two women, a mother uh, and a daughter. And uh, what they explore throughout their conversation, throughout the story itself, um, is sometimes a little hard to understand outside of Chile. And it is that Chile actually, by the end of dictatorship, was divided between almost a half of the country that still supported the dictator and another half that wanted him uh, to go, right? And the mother in this story is still very interested in the uh, dictatorship's legacy and also tells her story about how women, right-wing women, intervened decisively in a way that we would call today right-wing activism, if that is a term that we can use, how right-wing women had protagonism in convincing the military uh, to throw down Salvador Allende, right? That's a 
a lesser known story that I'm personally very interested in. The, the, the daughter of this woman is a historian, uh, a professor of history, uh, who is a left wing, wing inclined person who has studied the documents of the period and is contesting the mother's beliefs about what really happened at the time. Uh, and they extensively discuss the so-called Plan Zeta, the Plan Z, which was supposed to be a plan where uh, Salvador Allende was going to uh, have the whole bourgeoisie uh, annihilated. And that's what the story is about. So it's a, it's a tense story of a tense dialogue that closely relates with the um, respect that the mother has for the United States intervention and her own participation at the time, and the daughter who is contesting uh, the arguments of the mother. I won't tell you how that story ends. I don't want to spoil it, but I just wanted to give you a short sort of brief note about how my story connects to the theme that we're discussing and the theme that the book is about. Thank you. Thanks, um, thanks Lena. Thank you so much. Well, uh, <clears throat> I guess um, it's going to be, uh, from now on, by the way, I open the floor also to all the questions that can come from uh, from the, those who are watching us uh, uh, live. So if uh, you have any questions, please just drop them into the chat and uh, you know our speakers will respond. But I will pick up from uh, you know the conversation from what Lina has just uh, was talking about. Oh, actually, each one of you has, man has touched upon, which is the question and the, of, uh, on the one hand, the blurring. Uh, between fiction, reality, uh, Hussein has referred to lies, also in his written piece, which is a, which is a very deep reflection, you know, uh, he, he has reached the point uh, of that same despair, probably, that Ra was talking about at the beginning, that now there's no point of talking anymore about reality, but let's just, uh, you know, let's just embrace our own lies, you know. So I am wondering, and this is a question, uh, I have a double question, but I will start with the first one, is, uh, we live in a world, and Ra, I, I mean, let's restart from Ra again, uh, where, where do we really draw the line between reality and fiction? And I'm talking about this because uh, as, uh, you know, as part of the, of the work that I do, that I, you know, I research on the US political statements on countries of the third world and the south. Uh, in the past days, I also went back to the, to the address uh, that Colin Powell gave to the UN uh, Nation Security Council, and it's really it's it's stunning the way he's just he puts it because he's just saying uh, every statement I make today, and I'm quoting, is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we are giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. What we know and happened afterward is uh, that's that's a, that, that we know, you know. Uh, the invasion of Iraq, the country still, uh, you know, in a, in a forever war. Tony Blair has been uh, given a knighthood because of that as well. So, in an effort to counter uh, fiction with reality, we are trying to, you know, to un undo what appears as, as as objective. But at the same time, is that enough? Does that uh, proliferation of representation allow you also to counter? those structures you know what i mean that uh, are so in place i don't know this is uh, this is i'm just opening up and please feel free to reflect in whichever direction you want yeah th thank you matteo i think i start just by saying there's a quote at the beginning of the book which is a quote from howell pinter who in his later years was 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 despairing at what was going on with iraq um and the language of uh mendacity and lies uh, that the, the American uh, kind of administration was continually getting away with. Uh, in one of his essays and in a, in a speech he gave, in his Nobel laureate speech, he has this phrase, it didn't happen, it never happened, even when it was happening, it wasn't happening. Um, it, you know, the, the, the discussion, the discourse around some of these crimes and these interventions was so uh, two-faced and, uh, and, yeah, and mendacious that there was, it wasn't that, that there was a lack of information out there. It was just kind of a numbers game about how many how many times the media could reinforce 
the main narrative to the exclusion and to the obliteration of what, what the truth was. So I think we look at the word media and the word media is, is it's a complete misnomer in the first place because it's not a mediation between two parties, okay? And it's, it's, a, it's a top down delivery of a narrative uh, in all cases. And there's been lots of red herrings around uh, you know, social media, the internet. The internet was sold to us as kind of a level playing field and a leveler, leveler of communication and narratives. But it's actually more dominated and monopolized by enormous, you know, um, megalithic tech companies uh, than any other space, than even the, the, the tabloid newspaper space was in the in you know in the eighties in Britain. It's it's more biased than than any other you know any previous traditional or traditional media. It's more biased or as biased as the kind of one TV station, one uh, radio station uh, kind of country. You know, uh, Hussein talks about. Um, Turkey having one TV station or one uh, one radio station, the uh, the internet is pretty much the same. It's 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 Facebook or it's Google. Uh, it's just very or it's Apple. It's a very very small number of you know uh, megalithic corporations that are telling us things and promoting certain algorithms, and promoting certain reactions. So 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 the word media is is something we need to explode. I think essentially. Um, um, it comes back, it comes down to, you know, how, how do we know that, how do we believe one account, um, you know, a left wing account of what happened in Chile, as opposed to a conspiracy, you know, a, a, a nut job conspiracy theory about what's going on in America at the moment. Um, and it's a, it is a, it's a difficult one because you can open the door to complete kind of moral and epistemological relativism, really. You can say, you know, everything's true or everything's a lie. How do you pick your way through these things? Um, but I think there are certain, there's a certain number of ways of picking your way through things. Um, a lot of uh, right-wing narratives talk about um, the fact that certain certain kind of truths are being excluded when they're clearly not, or certain narratives or perspectives are being, uh, being excluded when they're clearly not. Uh, whilst uh, left-wing narratives talk more about uh, emotional truths or personal experiences. And, and ultimately, you have to you have to do two things. You have to kind of read the fiction and try and uh, try and ask yourself whether or not you find that kind of that has an emotional truth, a kind of a human truth, which is not based in 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 facts, but it's something else. Does this feel or sound true to you? Uh, do you believe in the characters? Do you believe uh, you know in in Lena's story? Uh, who do you believe, the mother or the daughter? And there's an emotional truth to what the daughter is is saying. And you recognize the kind of psychological denial processes that the mother is going through. Um, so, you, so you get to the truth there through uh, a psychological realism, a kind of emotional realism, uh, rather than a factual one. And you also, at the same time, uh, fall back on, um, on scientific, historical evidence and methodology. So you have to, you have to kind of uh, respect the institutions of history. You have to respect the institutions of, of science. You have to, you have to uh, respect not the, not, the, not the people or the structures, but the methodologies behind them uh, and the processes. So, so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a, it's a bit of a minefield to walk through, but I think there are, there are kind of, there are ways of, of uh, you know, shining a light and, and leading your, your own instincts through through this kind of potential relativism. Is anyone now, uh, does anyone want to jump in, Ursula or uh, Hussein? I mean, because uh, otherwise, yeah, please. So, yeah, th thank you for, for, for that. Uh, it's such an interesting insight, Rob. I also think that there is sort of a, the ethical question that really, uh, in, in this sort of uh, battle of truths or alternative truths, right, where we can't really figure out uh, who is saying uh, what is true and who is not. This is basically the theme of my, of my own story where the mother actually claims to be on sort of the right side of history, so to speak, because she was there and she saw what was happening while the daughter was too young to witness anything. And that is actually contrasted by the fact uh, that the daughter is a historian who has actually studied the documents. So I think that there's sort of a very central thing here where it's where, where does the truth come from? 
is, is evidence or is witnessing enough? Is the emotional response enough to claim truth over an event, right? Because we know we all have versions of what happened. And so I think that, that sort of it's, it's right there at the very beginning that they are contrasting uh, sort of their, where they get their information from. And the daughter is trying to make sure that the mother understands that what she thought was true was actually a forged document, uh, a, a constructed lie. Now, this is, of course, not enough. And I, what I always resort to is to think about uh, what is, who, who were the victims of the story? And when you look at the victims of the story and you look at the context of that sort of the, the production of, of violence and who applied violence to whom, I think you have a better sense of who, where the powers were and who was exerting violence to whom. We tend to get the story that we have two sides that are equally powerful and equally right. And the media tends to try to portray the two groups as equal. I think a lot about, for example, in contemporary terms, uh, the situation of Palestine, right? Where in the media, what we have is a performance of a sort of, um, uh, empate, I can't remember what that, a tie, a tie between two sides, right? And it's like, wait, but if we look actually at the strength of each side and the microphone that each side has, and speaking metaphorically here, you immediately see that there's a group in power, right, who has all the voice and a group disempowered who's been treated as terrorists and have no voice at all, right? And that is a sort of a very important important ethical question, right? Was the coup uh, justified by the perhaps apparent threat of socialism? Well, actually, no, because one uh, half of the country or a very large group of people suffered violence with the United States supporting the state that were exerting the, the violence. And I'm not saying that one thing is truer than other because there's more number of dead people. I'm just saying that for me, at the very end, we need to look at who suffered and who exerted violence. And that gives us a very good clue of where the truth might be. Thanks, Lena. Thank you. Hussein. Maybe I can add uh, something else. Um, I didn't talk uh, about uh, what was the uh, influence or invention of CIA in my country because I thought everyone knows. I mean, we, Everyone knows CIA doing these things. Everyone knows United Kingdom uh, ruled the uh, uh, rest of the world for a long time and trying to rule more, more now. Everyone knows who is right, who is wrong. I mean, uh, generally we know uh, what the powerful states or the hidden organization can do. Otherwise, their, uh, their power doesn't work, you know? So in a way, they show us who is the responsible, but uh, somehow because of his democratical rights or the laws or whatever you call, we cannot find enough proof to convince them to a uh, penalty or uh, commit to, to, uh, in the court or, or, or something else. So at the end, we know who's uh, bad or who's good, you know? In this case, I decided to only focus on what I want, what kind of world I want, you know? And I, I believe if we can question what kind of uh, world we are looking for, uh, whatever we do, uh, whatever, what kind of lives we use is a, not a guilt, a, not a sin to use it, you know? We need to convince the people through the uh, emotions, I guess. I think we need to convince the people with our uh, future, uh, future uh, uh, utopias. You know, I think we lost, uh, we we lost all kind of utopia. Now, and people doesn't follow you because not to believe uh, because uh, they don't see the truth or they don't see any future with you. You know, I mean. The opposition, uh, being os opposition is very difficult right now in, in the world, not in my, on, in my country, because we cannot represent or we cannot offer them better world or better life enough. You know, maybe we need to focus on this reality. We need to create our own 
uh, realistic uh, lies or whatever you call for them. Exa I want to give you an example. I mean, I want to give you an example of how the information doesn't change the people's behaviors. Uh, I don't know if you have, uh, if uh, some of you is smokers, yeah, do you smoke or not? But <laughs> I'm sure uh, for, uh, some of you smoking or some relatives are smoking. And, it is obvious smoking is killing, you know, making cancer. I mean, it's obvious. Hundred thousand percent is obvious, but still we are smoking until when we lose someone very close to us or some, uh, if, if you have some problem, you know, heart attack or whatever, then suddenly you stop because you think what will be happen to my beloved people, you know, family or son or daughter. Or, uh, most of the time we don't think ourselves, uh, but this emotionally attached, uh, things that uh, helps us to accept the reality. Otherwise, we don't attach anyone. I agree, at the beginning of uh, 19th century, the information was still powerful. I mean, they hide it from the people or who need it. But now, uh, they don't hide it. They just give more option to us. You know? <laughs> we don't have enough um, powerful question to reach to reality or reach to information. Anymore, yeah. You know, uh, so I think we need to focus on more uh, to create a better life or better lives or better utopias. You know, maybe in this case, uh, if we can create it, then the people will reach the reality or information very easily in this uh, Facebook or inter internet or whatever. I mean, there are there are, but not front of us, we need to find out, we need to find the way, we need, uh, we need to feel to find, out, find those uh, things. I mean, in this case, I don't want to um, sacrifice or I don't want to lose my hope to uh, write or making films because then the people will need this information or these things I had to do, I had to write, otherwise they will not reach to us too, I mean, that's why I'm really thankful to the uh, publishers. And uh, Ra, you are like a hero. I mean, uh, you say you, are, you have a very difficult uh, life, but I'm sure people will reach. I mean, some not maybe today, uh, but sure tomorrow, you know? Uh, and I believe the making films are uh, the same. I mean, somehow film works and when people need it to find and they find the story or films. Uh, so. My approach is uh, so far like this. Uh, Hussein, thanks. No, I mean, uh, and this is probably, we, we go with this one more round that I have for you guys, which makes me think about, uh, you said in a way that, uh, yeah, it's easier, uh, I don't remember, I think I heard somewhere, but in a way it's easier to imagine that the apocalypse, I'm going to die by smoking rather than the utopia. I'm going to quit smoking, you know, it's easier to go down the, the drain rather than really thinking of, uh, of of imagining to restructure where you know the way i live or uh, you know the, the economic system in a way but uh, one and this is the question that with this i'm going to end because otherwise i can go on and on and i, I would like to hear any of you on this question uh, we don't have any more source of information we actually have too many of them in a way so it makes me think of the question of the commodification of knowledge and i'm thinking of this in the sense of there is too much, you know, in a way, capitalism, it's interest to produce and produce. Yeah, it's OK. Give us a little bit the voice of the Kurds. Give us a little bit of the Iraqi. Give us a bit of the US establishment. How are we going? You know, is there is there a limit? Can we exploit this contradiction? Or if we fall into this contradiction, we continue to re reproduce that same system then? And uh, I don't know if you want to just give us some thoughts on this, and then I promise I will leave. If I can add to to what um, to the previous question, but it's related to this one. In fact, uh, there are two things, two points I wanted to make. Uh, one is about journalism, and uh, of course we we saw embedding, and uh, uh, but before embedding, there was. Uh, uh, an astonishing thing, which was, uh, um, again, you know, going back to my experience, I was based, uh, I was living in Belfast in 1988, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92. So in these four years, 
I saw, and in Belfast, uh, I mean, uh, it, 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 there was no ceasefire yet. I raised ceasefire, so it was, uh, it was still, uh, the conflict was still going on, the troubles were still on. And in 40 years, I saw maybe two foreign correspondents coming to Belfast. And I was reading a lot of uh, articles from the British, in the British press, in the Italian, in, uh, you know, in the world press about the north of Ireland. And I was always, I was always so, you know, because like Hussein was saying, I was walk, I was living in, uh, living on the false road and I was walking around <laughs> Belfast on the false road and I was seeing, you know, checkpoint this one, that one, that. And I was reading the articles on the on the media, on the international press, and there was, you know, it was completely different. So the articles about uh, the north of Ireland were actually written in London uh, or in Rome or in Milan. And I was thinking, you know, this is amazing because they, they are writing about something, taking news from somewhere, but they are actually not here. They 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 are never they never came except of course when the when the talks started and then where they were coming so you know uh, this thing about reality or what the truth but which truth and where then came embedding which is uh, uh, which is a, a, an extension to this because before they were not coming then they were all going the problem was they were all going attached to the military so again it was uh, one side of the story and uh, and very controlled. On the other hand, the same kind of things applied to to fiction and uh, and to cinema to a certain extent. To fiction, in a sense that the, together with the with the with the with this type of journalism, there was a, uh, there was a fiction as well uh, and a narrative attached to it, which related to fiction. So writers were writing about uh, uh, again the north of Ireland. And you know, and there were some so many uh, stereotype uh, characters. So the IRA was the IRA, IRA uh, volunteer was always always uh, farting, uh, uh, telling bad words, big nose, big ears. You know, like the worst of the the worst of the club. So there was you know the same for Kurds. Uh, you know, in 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 fiction, uh, in uh, Turkish fiction, for example. So you know, there was this narrative which was uh, going from you know the the truth, like from the media, through to na through to through to fiction, and it was the same narrative. This changed, and uh, and uh, I have to say that this changed thanks to uh, to two things, perhaps one that uh, the people uh, from the other side. Uh, started to talk about themselves and to write about themselves and to reclaim their own stories and history, and uh, and so they they started to create their own media, their own uh, publisher, or finding publisher publishers like uh, like Coma, for example. For, for this, I was saying at the beginning about you know Gaza, not because there was not information about Gaza and there were not books about Gaza, but but it was the first kind of example where actually people from Gaza under the bombs and under siege were actually given voice and, and given the possibility to say what was going on. And, and this was amazing. And, and who was doing this? A British publisher. I mean, you know, so this and which obviously uh, worked as a, you know, as a megaphone amplifying what was uh, going, uh, what was going on uh, there. The same apply to, to a different, uh, in a different way, but uh, similar uh, to Kobane, the Battle of Kobane. Then, of course, that was, again, mystified by most of the media because then it, it was just one Focus and it was this the beautiful uh, uh, Kurdish girls fighting uh, the Islamic State, and um, but again you know but this uh, kind of there is uh, you know the wall is being broken somehow thanks to 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 the work uh, to the work of publisher uh, like Coma but uh, and also to, to 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 the work of journalists and to the work of of writers who actually reclaim their own uh, their own history and and say no no we won't delegate we speak we write about ourselves which is what kind of is turning you know the way uh, things are going lena 
Yes, I, I really thought that, uh, you know, it's a very provocative question and I, I loved what uh, Orsola said. Um, you were talking, Mateo, about uh, co-optation, basically, capitalism, overproducing news and giving small spaces to each so that we are all happy because our voices were heard. But at the same time, I think Orsola was referring to the real fact that there were so many voices that were not heard, right? And voices that were actually in stories that were actually appropriated by let's say the wrong people, right? Uh, the people who were not there, the people who did, had no experience of the subject or had uh, maybe we could say the wrong version of what was going on, right? And then the repetition and the reiteration that is also occurring in the literary wor world of stereotypes, right? So I think that those two things are not mutually exclusive, but there's an interesting sort of complement, right? Yes, uh, you know, social media and uh, capitalism has given way to these silenced voices, but also to shut them out. And there's this constant sort of contest of having uh, writers and literary writers not reiterate the sort of the official narrative that is also somehow uh, in, in the, the, the doings of capitalism and telling a story that is proper, that is authentic, that is coming from the place and that is not repeating stereotypes. And I think that one of the things, and this is not related to the, to the anthology itself, but one of the things that worries me is that we tend to fetishize uh, literature as if literature was always transgressive, as if li literary imagination was always going against the grain. And I don't think that's true. I myself, uh, when I started writing, felt uh, you know, that literature was the most transgressive field and that's where I wanted to be, only to find out that in fact, a lot of writers don't do the work of thinking and thinking against the grain and uh, doing the, the right research and putting the heart in it and are just sort of repeating things that they haven't thought uh, through. And, and in that way, they're just maybe confirming the uh, sort of official narrative, right? That we know who rules that narrative. And so in that way also, I think that Coma is doing a very important work in bringing not only local writers, but writers who are willing to uh, think against the grain uh, in terms of that official narrative of the uh, intervention of the United States as democrat democratizing the world rather than actually invading it for its own uh, purposes. So I, I think that these books are very important. And I also think that uh, a word must be said about translation as well because it's not that in locally these stories do not exist, it's that they haven't been heard also because they haven't been translated not only into English, but into many other languages. And so I would just uh, want to, to say bravo to those translators that many times also are for people coming from other places are sort of the bridge uh, for our stories to you know, arrive to the publishers and also be, um, Red. Uh, Usain, yeah. Okay. Um, I want to uh, discuss um, through your question one thing. I mean, when we uh, talking about uh, uh, fiction or nonfiction, uh, we represent nonfiction part like a reality. Actually, nonfiction is a kind of a language, uh, again, part of the narrative. The narrative has a different way of uh, reaching to people. And one is uh, from the beginning, says uh, in fiction ones, uh, th they say these are the reality or the lives of the writers. So if you believe it, uh, continue to read. Other ones uh, represent, ah, these are the realities and uh, document it and uh, someone's uh, giving us a uh, way of to reach these realities. I think uh, we should also discuss uh, what kind of language we use uh, for the narrative, I mean, for the both sides, non-fiction and fiction. Uh, we are under the, the didactic uh, information uh, and didactic narrative from the media and from the big movies, you know. They don't want us to think, you know. They just want to, us to read or uh, see and watch and nothing else. But uh, maybe we, we can discuss uh, 
we we cannot tell the people what is the truth, but we can maybe during our way of telling stories, we can uh, show them how can they they can reach the truth if they need it. You know, we need to give this uh, uh, beginning to the human being. Otherwise, uh, they will de demand on uh, something else. I mean, we are not uh, also. Uh, giving them hope, you know, we, we are, our side is very terrible, dark, you know, uh, pain, you know, you're under the always uh, uh, trait, you know, like, I'm lucky that I'm not an academician or a journalist, and I know how, uh, how should be difficult to journalist or academician in this time of the world. It's horrible in Turkey, I know that, but I'm sure the rest of the world is the same. Uh, so, but, during our narrative uh, 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 works, we need to discuss uh, the main uh, simple things about the human beings. I think human beings uh, more close to being uh, analytical, you know? Uh, we like to find things ourselves. How from, that's the narrative, I think. The help can, can, can come from the narrative. But if we can give this, we don't need to beg or we don't need to put 100,000 of the truth to convince the readers or uh, viewers, you know? This is, a, this is their system, this is, uh, they do, not us. I mean, they lie, they organize big lies or big fiction lies or big non-fiction lies, you know, like a CNN or BBC, whatever. Um, so uh, now uh, I'm trying to do this through to my films or uh, to the writing. I mean, I don't know how I will uh, approach, uh, but yes, I just wanted to also discuss this, you know, how we will uh, approach uh, to the narrative or non-fiction or fiction. Thanks, Hussain. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I agree totally. It's just, um, uh, I mean, I see how, you know, building the house is so important precisely that, uh, and I agree, I agree very much on, with both you and Lina, you know, that, you know, it, we definitely need to open up the space and, uh, and uh, it's, it's just that it's a question that also reflects, you know, when I see that the amount of knowledge that is created, for example, in a field like academic field, you know, and then there are same, there are always the same stories that gain the relevance, then I'm, I'm wondering what's going, is there something wrong? You know? So that's uh, Ra, anyway. Yeah, I, I just want to pick up on a couple of things because it's really, really interesting. Um, first of all, I, I just want to carry on what Lena was saying about how literature isn't necessarily tra a transgressive form. I think there's a lot of narrative types which are quite the quite the opposite and and, and sometimes perpetuate what Lena was talking about when she talks about the tie, this this uh, fictional balance between conflicting sides. I think uh, many years ago, David Hare uh, gave a presentation where he talked about a production of Romeo and Juliet that was put on in, in Jerusalem, uh, where they had Israelis and Palestinians playing Capulets and Montagues. Um, and I think that false uh, idea of balance, that false idea of you know, they're just like, you know, a lot of the time there's just a, there's a conflict and there's something very, very simple and emotional that needs to be resolved. And you just need to, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's, it's relatively empty in terms of uh, whether or not the one side has a better case than another. This, this neutrality, this, this false balance, which is always presented, is something that the BBC does all the time uh, and something so many media organisations uh, kind of, um, they they pretend to to kind of uh, acknowledge both sides and they and they kind of present it as as balanced. But by doing that, you're essentially presenting what they think is a neutral narrative. But because there's always bias, because there's all in reality, one side is always stronger than the other. Um, what it what its results on you as a viewer is you uh, oh. you just you don't particularly take sides. So. Uh, the bias continues. To put it another way, uh, Howard Zinn, the famous American uh, historian, said, there's no standing still on a moving train. And we're on a moving train. There are biases everywhere. Um, there, are, there are power structures everywhere. So the train is always moving. So if you stand still, you're moving with the train. There's no neutrality or balance uh, possible in that reference frame. It's basic physics, really, in a way, uh, in the analogy. So a lot of literary structures are often used to 
to perpetuate this idea of, of balance. So the Romeo and Juli Julietification of certain struggles happens all the time. In Britain, there was a, in the, in the early eighties, there was a, a famous play that was turned into a film, uh, My Beautiful Laundrette, which presented kind of uh, uh, left-wing, um, kind of uh, left-wing gay Indian community uh, fighting with, fighting with skinhead fascists and in the end they kind of fall in love like Romeo and Juliet uh, across the across the boundary and it kind of negates the real substance of the conflict and America loves lots of uh, lots of kind of uh, feel good the American administrations lot uh, love to have kind of feel good touchy-feely kind of moments where they bring sides together so there's a there's a project called Seeds of Peace uh, in America that brings uh, Israeli and uh, Palestinian kids together and they spend uh, a few weeks in a kind of a, a camp, a uh, holiday camp type space and they get to know each other. And that's the, that's often the kind of neutral Romeo and Juliet version of how you solve these problems. Um, interesting, like, um, interestingly, my partner, Basma, when she was a kid, when she was about 15, she went on one of these. And it turned out that there were uh, 15 uh, Palestinians to to uh, something like 60 Israelis and half half the people that she went on this, uh, half the Palestinians she went on this camp with, uh, or, or many of them are now dead because of uh, conflict since, uh, because of the, the second intifada. So, it, it, you know, the idea that you can all hug and uh, make friends or love can, can, uh, uh, can bridge over these divides or these these kind of cheesy literary conceits can can bridge these things comes from literature and is obviously is obviously completely nonsense we we sometimes like our narratives to come especially with serialization the serialized narratives like tv series um we like uh, our characters to come back to a, a state of equilibrium or, or balance at the end of every every episode and the way story structure is often taught is you have, you know, conflict, escalation, resolution. And because we need that resolution all the time, uh, in the end, uh, those kind of narratives suggest um, that it's just, an, it's just a kind of emotional battle struggle which can be resolved at the end of this story. And these things are solvable in simple kind of emotional narrative terms. Um, and the result of that is we don't really give much weight to the to the historical reality of 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 years or decades of of war and intervention and power um, and oppression so literature in a way is 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 as guilty as any other medium as guilty as the as as the news for perpetuating these very very simplified kind of versions of uh of of com of these conflicts um and you see in in the world of literature exactly what um uh Osler was talking about in terms of centralized figures writers going out and writing about something you know uh, newspapers and radio stations and tv stations love to have their man or their woman on out in the field and they love to hear from their familiar faces and apparently readers love to read columns by familiar faces um and it's the same with literature if you go to a lot of festivals it's it's the same writers this time writing about a different subject um and because we like familiar faces, or, or because those are the those are the faces or uh, writers that which are kind of championed. We get the same story or the same set of uh, perspectives every time. So it's a problem. But the ultimate solution is the decentralization of all of this. Is to is to uh, encourage. I think is to encourage readers to just to to get used to reading writers that they're not familiar with. Um, yeah, and to decentralize that, that, that set of perspectives. Thanks, Ra, thank you. Uh, I would uh, probably end it here unless there are any last uh, thoughts on your side. Well then, uh, well, uh, let me thank you, each one of you so much for, uh, you know, for being here today. It has been a pleasure, uh, you know, to participate also on my part to this uh, anthology for this little afterward that I wrote. But uh, it has been a great, a much bigger pleasure to have you here and discuss with all of you the content and beyond uh, the issues beyond uh, what, you know, what the anthology does. I also want to thank Security in Context uh, for uh, hosting this event. Uh, I really hope that our paths will cross again. It has been a real pleasure, really. Thank you so much, each one of you.